Thanks for the blessing. Well, you already get preached out a while. Let's go to First Timothy one. First Timothy chapter one. We'll read the whole chapter. Let's all stand together as we read the Word of God. First Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy... My own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, having turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust." And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Known to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare holding faith, and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they learn not to blaspheme. If you will, look back at verse 10. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if they be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. What I want to preach about this morning for a little while is sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. So let's pray together, and then we'll preach for a little while and see what God has for us. All right? Brother Glenn, you pray for me, would you?
Amen. You can be seated. We see so many things happening in our world today. And I want to start off by saying this, that we live in a messed up world. Let me rephrase that. Spiritually, we live in a messed up world. We really do. Spiritually, this world is a disaster. I mean, we look at the politics of this world, we look at all the other things going on in this world, and we think, what a mess it is. But I believe wholly that we would not see the political problems, the uh, sexual problems, the emotional problems, all the things that this world's going through today if we were not so messed up spiritually. Amen, amen, and amen. We live in a messed up world spiritually. Can I say that people chase men rather than chasing sound doctrine? They'd rather just believe what they hear instead of opening their Bible and finding out if it's true or not. Check it out. I encourage you today to open your Bible, read along with me, see if what I say is not so. Sound doctrine comes from the book. And we must preach the book. And what is said must come from the book. Too many preachers today are running around preaching their opinion. They're teaching people how to feel good about themselves, how to have a better life, to get along with their neighbor. Let me tell you to get along with their neighbor. Invite them to church and share the gospel of Christ with them. That's how you get along with your neighbor. Don't worry about what they think about you or this. Let me tell you something. People are always going to think weird things about you. It's in the book. If you're saved, people are going to think weird things about you. That's just all there is to it. Just get used to it and accept it. It's just the way it is. Can I tell you they thought ill of Jesus Christ, and why in the world would they think any different about you? There are many who preach and teach what is not sound doctrine. There's many who preach and teach a false doctrine. And when a false doctrine is presented to the church, presented to mankind, then these preachers and these pastors have failed in teaching in preaching, in guidance, in study. They failed in communion with the Holy Ghost. They have failed in setting the example for the church. They have failed in being an ensample for the church. They have failed their family. They failed their friends. They failed God. And most of all, they failed the Scripture. Preachers today are a mess. And you know why? They don't hold the standard of this book. Churches fail because of lack of sound doctrine. However, some churches, quote unquote, churches thrive because of a lack of sound doctrine. I spoke with a friend of mine on the phone yesterday who's been attending a larger church, and he said this. He said there's no teaching or preaching on doctrine. Everyone there just loves one another. He said there's no depth. There's no Bible. And then he said this. He said, I believe it's probably time for me to move on because I'm not being fed there. I did a little research on what happens to the mind when the body is being starved. And what happens is it says that the body protects the mind and the brain first off because it's the most important organ of the body. So it kind of doesn't realize it's being starved at first. But according to the research that I read, it said that eventually the the brain begins to consume its own neurons which creates within the individual, are you ready for this? Depression, anxiety, 
stress, unhappiness, simply because it's not being fed. When a Christian's not being fed sound doctrine, you know what happens to that Christian? They become depressed. They have anxiety. They can't get along with other people. You know why churches face so much in, internal strife? People are not being fed sound doctrine. We must have sound doctrine. I liked what uh, Brother Glenn and Miss Paula told me not too long ago. But they told me I'm an oddball. I said, why am I an oddball? They said, you don't find many missionary Baptist churches with a pastor who has a doctorate degree. Can I tell you, that's a shame. Because the problem is, men must be taught. They must be prepared for ministry. They must be taught the book. And if they're not taught the book, they're not prepared for ministry. Just because a man says he's called to preach does not qualify him for ministry. When a man stands up and says he's called to preach, it's time for him to begin to prepare himself for ministry. Well, that got quiet. There's too many loose cannons running around out there in the world, folks. I believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God calls men to pastor churches. Notice what I said. He calls men to pastor churches. You say, how do you know that? Because one of the qualifications of being a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. Don't argue with me. Take it up with the Lord. I didn't say it, God said it, I just repeated it. Amen, amen, and amen. That's sound doctrine. We must, we must hold to sound doctrine. Because if we do not hold to sound doctrine, what's going to happen is people are going to be taught every ism and schism in the world today, and what you're going to have is spiritual chaos. God calls men to pastor churches, but I also believe this, that when God calls a man to ministry, he will call them from a local church. You say, why? No loose cannon. Things done decently and in order. Things must be done properly. When a man is trained and ready to go, he must be ordained and sent out by the local church. It's the ministry of a local church. Here's the first problem with sound doctrine. Are you ready? And I've already hit it pretty hard. Pastors don't teach or preach it. Pastors do not teach or preach sound doctrine. Look in Titus with me, if you will, for just a moment. Titus chapter 1. If you flip over just a couple pages toward the back of your book, you'll get to Titus. And look at chapter 1, verse 9. Or let's start in verse 7, rather. Titus chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says, for a bishop, that's a pastor, must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught 
that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. It's the bishop's responsibility to do what? To teach and to preach sound doctrine. I spent most of my life studying this book. Delving through this book. To the point of where my relationship with my wife suffered because of it. My children had a heart. I mean, they gave up many, many hours with their daddy when they were little. Because I was in school. I was studying and I was preparing for ministry. We must teach sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is a must. Look at chapter 2 of Titus and verse 1. Paul tells Titus, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Now, the word speak there is very interesting because it not only refers to what comes out of our mouth, but can I say it also refers to our life. Have you ever heard the expression, your actions speak louder than your words? A bishop must not only speak verbally sound doctrine, but he must live a life that exhorts sound doctrine. Over my years on this earth, I have seen so many men fall because they preach sound doctrine and they might have spoke it, but they didn't live it. Jim Baker. Remember him? Who was the other guy? I can't even think of his name now. Jimmy Swaggart. Oh, he sounded good. He preached real good. But you know what you found out about him? He couldn't live it. He couldn't live it. We not only verbalize sound doctrine, we must live in accordance to sound doctrine. Now, let me say this. As I preach to you sound doctrine, and I teach to you sound doctrine, and I set an example as sound doctrine, guess what it becomes to you? Your responsibility to speak sound doctrine and to live Sound doctrine. Y'all with me? Shake your head up and down this way. Nothing to shake loose, I promise. I could name you preacher after preacher after preacher after preacher after preacher that it's happened to. We must teach, we must speak sound doctrine. We live in a day of media bombardment. Television, radio, internet, books, audio books, you name it, we got it. You can hear everyone and everything today. But how do you know if what you hear is right or wrong? It's got to be in the book. And it's got to be in accordance with the book. 
If it's not in accordance with the book, it's wrong. I listen to this guy on the radio coming home from work every day. And some days I have to turn him off because he just makes me so mad I'm ready to spit. And if I could reach through the radio and get a hold of him, I probably would. But so many things, sometimes he says things that are just so far off base. But then I sit and I wonder to myself, how many other people know what he's saying is not sound doctrine? Then I get even madder, Brother Ron, because I, then I realize how much he's affecting those people, how much he's affecting their families, how much he's affecting their churches, how much he's affecting other people's eternity because he's not speaking sound doctrine. Well, Brother David, he read a verse and I saw it and I know it's in that book. What's the context? What's the time frame? Who said it? When were they speaking? You want an example? Let me show you an example. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now if we just looked at that verse, what would we think? Repent, water baptism, Right? Then you get the Holy Ghost. But let's look at it for just a moment. Number one, who said it? Peter. When did he say it? During a time in the early church, right after the death of Christ, when you saw this huge transition taking place, going from Old Testament law to New Testament grace, the emphasis being on God the Father to the emphasis being on God the Son. You started to see a change going over from Jew to Gentile. So many things changing in the book of Acts. Peter said it. He said it at a time of transition. But if you go through Acts chapter 2, you're going to find something very interesting. He said in verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea. Verse 22, Ye men of Israel. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. Now you cross-reference that over to, uh, I believe it's chapter 8 in Acts. And you're going to find a man here by the name of Philip. And Philip begins to witnessing to a eunuch. And what's the first thing we find out about this eunuch? He's an Ethiopian, which makes him what? A Gentile. When you get down to verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came under a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way, what? Rejoicing. Do you see the difference? First he made a profession of faith. Then he was baptized. A huge difference, isn't there? But see, you got people today who will take Acts 2.38 and teach it as doctrine. 
Not today. Not today. Salvation is by grace through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe it in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We must speak the things that become sound doctrine. We must verify it and prove it with the book. Let me tell you the second problem I see. Pastors don't preach it, and people don't listen to it. People don't listen to it. But go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 with me. I'm doing everything I can not to get ahead of myself. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. And look at me at verse 6. From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. I heard a preacher years ago preach a message called Swerve and Mervin. <laughs> From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. It might sound really good, But you know what the Bible defines it here as? Vain jangling. If it doesn't line up with the book, Brother Dean, it's vain. And it causes people to do what? What did Paul tell Timothy? It causes them to swerve. To turn away from God. To turn away from the book. To turn after what they want to hear instead of what they need to believe. Look at chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Start with me in verse 1. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You know what we're seeing today? We're seeing the falling away coming of the church as prophesied in the book of Thessalonians. You know why the church is turning away? Because people have itching ears and they're willing to follow whatever scratches that itch. It's vain jangling. It's taking them away. It's causing them to swerve from the truth. And can I tell you, it's affecting you. It's affecting your family. It's affecting your church. It's affecting people's eternities because we're not listening to sound doctrine any longer. You say, preacher, you sound a little upset about it. I am. You know why? Because it's robbing people of a home in heaven. It's robbing people of living wonderful lives serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It's robbing the church of people who, want, who could do something for God and be a great blessing. And it's taking those people out of the church. It's destroying their lives, destroying their families, taking away their testimony, and causing people not to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to be upset about that sort of thing. We need to be mad about that sort of thing. Well, we're just all going to love each other. Ooh. Why are you here? We're here to set an example. We're here to be a testimony. We're here to win people to Christ. 
when we have itching ears and we listen to vain jangling and we follow those who do not speak sound doctrine or live sound doctrine, we're causing other people to fall. Folks, we've got to follow sound doctrine. Christians today would rather listen to a fable than to listen to the truth. Look at Galatians chapter 4 for just a minute. Galatians chapter 4. It started me in verse 8. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. How be it then when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. Look at this next verse. Paul said, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon, your lab- upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus." Where is then the blessedness ye speak of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them unto me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, and they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, And not only when I am present with you, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again unto Christ, be formed in you. And I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Paul said he doubted them. Paul said he was afraid of them. He said, am I, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? See, what he was trying to tell them is this. He said, I've given you enough truth. This is so cool, Deb. You ready for this? He said, I've given you enough truth that if you take the vain jangling and the things you've heard because of itching ears, you're dangerous. Because you know what you, ha- what you have? When someone preaches a false doctrine, Brother Nick, there's enough truth mixed in it to make it sound good. Amen. Paul said, I'm afraid of you. Why aren't we afraid? Why aren't we delving into that book and proving that the things that you hear are sound doctrine? They become a danger. I was thinking as I was preparing this message, I thought of a fish. And someone who fishes. And what do they use to catch fish? A lure. You know what that lure is? It's a false representation of the truth. It looks like something they want. 
it lights up, it jiggles, and it wiggles, and it rattles sometimes, and it swims a certain way. And all that lure does is it causes that fish to excite a reaction against that lure. Am I right? But by the time he opens his mouth and grabs a hold of it, you know what he figured out? It's too late. Where if old Mr. Bass had just taken a little time, you all understand what I'm saying? Had taken a little time and looked at it a little harder and studied it a little closer, he wouldn't find himself in the mess of having a hole in his lip. You want to know what some of you all are? You're hooked. You're hooked. The third problem with false doctrine is this. It produces a shipwreck. As we read in 1 Timothy. Now why would Paul talk about a shipwreck? Well, here's what I believe. At the time when Paul wrote this, probably the greatest tragedy that they could face would have been a shipwreck. Today we talk about plane crashes and car crashes and this happening and that happening and so on and so forth. But in that day, a lot of the transportation was done by ship. And a huge tragedy would have been a shipwreck. You know what Paul likens a Christian who listens to unsound doctrine to? A shipwreck. He says it's a shipwreck waiting to happen. It's a tragic thing when someone turns from sound doctrine and goes after fables. And it's more tragic when they take others with them, making them a part of the shipwreck. It affects lives. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we read about two men by the name of Hymenaeus and Alexander. And Paul recognized the tragedy that these men were causing. And what did Paul do? He turned them over to Satan. The result of listening to false doctrine is a shipwreck. You say, preacher, why would you preach all of this? I don't want any of you in a shipwreck. I don't want any of us in a shipwreck. I don't want any of us in a tragedy. I want the church to grow. I want it to flourish. I want it to be strong. But in order for that to happen, we must live, listen, and speak sound doctrine. I'm going to do things a little bit different for an invitation today. If you'll have some, li- let your pastor have a little liberty, and I know you will. But the first part of the invitation is this. That if you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there's never been a time in your life when you've accepted Christ. Talk about a tragedy. You need to be saved. And you can be saved today. 
And I invite you to talk to the person next to you to come and talk to me, talk to my wife, if you're concerned about where you'll spend eternity. That's the first part of the invitation. And the second part of the invitation is this. Normally when we do live stream, the guys fade out as we start the invitation. But today, Kirby, if you would, just let it run a little bit. And here's what I'm going to ask everybody to do. If you're here today and you're saved, and you want to follow sound doctrine, speak sound doctrine, live sound doctrine, do it right, and you believe that what I've preached today is true, then here's what I'm going to ask each and every person to do. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. Stand right now. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Pray it out loud. Dear Lord, allow me always to be filled with sound doctrine. Help me to listen. Help me to study. And help me to learn. Protect me from itching ears and vain jangling. Allow me to follow truth and not to follow fables. Prevent me from being a shipwreck or causing someone else to be a shipwreck. Allow me to live according to Scripture and give me the ability and courage to avoid those teaching preaching, and living fables. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We must follow sound doctrine. And we must always have it and strive for it. And sometimes it's going to take some courage to stand up against false doctrine. But we must. And we must do it together. We must. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, we thank you for the service we've had this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the scripture. How, Father, you can open it up to us and show us sound doctrine that's good and perfect for us to live by. Not only in this life, but Lord, in eternity. And Father, I ask you to bless those, Father, who really meant the prayer that we've prayed today. That, Father, you would answer this prayer in their heart, in their lives, in their homes, in our church. Help us to stand for sound doctrine. Help us to represent sound doctrine. Help us to speak sound doctrine, both verbally and in our lives. Father, we ask for your protection. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your wisdom. Father, we love you. We love your Son. And we love the Holy Ghost. And Father, we ask you, Dear Lord, if there be one here today that doesn't know Christ, Lord, please allow them to reach out to someone, to have the courage to say, I'm concerned about where I will spend eternity. Father, I thank you for all you've done for me, for my family, and for this church. And Father, I pray that you continue to strengthen us, to fill us with your love, with your wisdom, and with your might. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 One last thing. Brother Terry asked me to announce that there'd be no choir practice this afternoon. So,
Okay. God bless y'all. We'll see you tonight. Brother Jim.